Hi guys, Ollie here, welcome back. This is just gonna be a hopefully very quick, non-meandering uh, summary of what I've been up to in the last five weeks, kind of how we're getting on with COVID and the stuff that I've been seeing in hospital and the stuff that I've been doing outside. So specifically, as I'm sure you can tell from the title, I have just finished my what's called SCP-3, Specialty Clinical Placement 3, at Warwick, which was acute medicine. So what is acute medicine um, would be the obvious thing to address first. It is, as the name suggests, um, acute, rapid, quick. It is dealing with presentations that either appear very quickly or I guess get dangerous very quickly and knowing how to deal with them in an acute setting. So A&E, for example, accident and emergency or emergency medicine, might be the most obvious specialty to think about in acute medicine. It also covers presentations that, as I say, either appear quickly or can be resolved quickly. So that includes lots of dangerous conditions like sepsis, cardiac arrhythmias, um, allergy, diabetic ketoacidosis. All of these things are covered in acute medicine because of how spontaneously they appear. Obviously, if someone has an anaphylactic reaction to something, that's near instantaneous. If someone develops a pneumothorax, instantaneous. If someone has a heart attack, instantaneous. You have to be willing and ready to deal with it kind of at a moment's notice, and that's what acute medicine is really about. So in practice, what that meant for us is basically one day spent in all the different kinds of acute settings. So ED, we did days in the other acute medicine wards, so that might be uh, MDU or AMU, which are medical decisions units or acute medical units. And these are short stay wards essentially, where again, depending on the specifics of the department and your local hospital probably has departments like this. But if someone comes in with a problem that can be dealt with within the same day, for example, but they need to stay in hospital for a short period of time, they might go to an ambulatory care unit. The patient comes in, they get treated, give them whatever they need and they leave so they don't have to take up hospital bed or they might go on to somewhere like MDU, a medical decisions unit, where they're brought in for maybe up to three days so they need a very short stay in hospital but they don't need to be referred to a specialist unit, they don't need to go to say a cardiac ward, a respiratory ward or a surgery ward, they still need to be in hospital and looked after by doctors and nurses but their condition is not so rare or specialist that it requires taking up a bed on a specialist unit. And for us medical students, when we're on the ward rounds and we're seeing and examining all these different patients, acute medicine is one of those specialties where you really have to be prepared for anything to appear like being in GP almost, but in a hospital setting where you've got access immediately to blood tests and x-rays and CT scans and even ECGs, all these more specialist things because you're in a hospital environment. Um, so that can be pretty helpful when you're thinking about your workup. So a typical day for me as a student on acute medicine might have been join the ward round, or if there was a pre-ward round, you might join that where the juniors get the notes ready for the actual ward round. You then do the ward round where you and maybe some junior doctors uh, and a registrar might go around with the consultant and you'd see, you know, 10, 15 patients, depending on which particular unit you were on. They might ask you to write in the notes, for example, because the consultant needs to see the patients quickly and their time is very valuable. So either one of the juniors or yourself as the medical student, if you're confident in doing it, um, can write in the notes as you go around. And then this will create a jobs list essentially for the juniors to do. So patient one might need some bloods doing, patient two might need an x-ray or some results chasing up, might need to speak to patient three's family, and so on and so forth. It creates this long jobs list. Ward round would finish. The consultant will have been asking you questions probably as you go around about all these different conditions. So, you know, if you saw a cardiac patient, they might ask you like, which nerves supply the heart, where do they come off the spinal cord, or which part of the brain is affected in this patient, or how do we classify this fracture according to this scoring system, or this person had a pulmonary embolism, 
what's the new first line treatment for PE under the new NICE guidelines. It's just things like this to keep you on your toes and it's good preparation for final exams. So then we do the ward round, um, consultant would go off to wherever it is that consultants disappear to and then you'd be left with the juniors usually or uh, the SHOs, the senior house officers to do these jobs. So any of them that I was confident of doing as a med student, some things I can do with some utility. So going and running blood gases or I could take bloods and send them off to the lab or take them to the lab if they needed to go. Even chasing up blood results with the lab and scans and things like that. As long as you have the requisite access um, as a medical student to the various systems and you know how to use the phones, you can actually do most of these tasks. And it feels a bit weird to ring the lab, you know, the, the pathology lab or biochemistry or whatever. And, and I'm so-and-so, I'm trying to chase up the results for this patient on this ward. Can you please tell me what they are? And it can feel a bit weird and a bit kind of above your station to chase results up and things in the lab. But actually what I found is that 99% of the time they're very understanding and they're perfectly happy to not only give you the results you want, but to talk you through any part of it that you don't understand. And what is nice, maybe this is just because I'm a more senior medical student, particularly with the experience I've had working on the cardiology unit over the last few months, more as an employee than a student. But once you get very confident in understanding how the various systems work, you are actually able to contribute. And the juniors particularly tend to be um, very thankful for the things that you're able to do for them because it means they can concentrate on their own task list. So there's that side of things. And then the more learning side, um, our block lead, who was excellent by the way, was very keen for us to work on our skills independently. So we were split between two trusts, at least I was. I was split between University Hospital Coventry, the big tertiary centre teaching hospital, and Warwick Hospital, South Warwickshire Foundation Trust. So two of the main hospitals that you visit. And particularly at Warwick, they would have us clerking patients, um, clerking is when a patient newly presents and no one kind of knows anything about them other than maybe the paramedics that brought them in. They need formally documenting, you know, you need to take a history, do any relevant exams, summarise any medications they're taking, work out a basic management plan. The doctors there were very keen for us to be doing these things by ourselves as a member of the team. Um, you know, if, if I was on with one of the juniors and two patients come in, they'd be very much, you know, um, Ollie, do you want to take that one into that cubicle and I'll take this one into this cubicle and we'll meet up afterwards and discuss what we're going to do. And that includes coming up with a basic management plan. So a key experience to talk about is that I'd seen a patient by myself. I had kind of done the clerking booklet, had done a full history, got their meds, um, kind of gone through all of it with them, done the requisite physical exams, listened to the chest, um, had a quick once over neurologically. and. Uh, had my booklet, took it back to the consultant because all the patients have to be reviewed by a consultant anyway. And she was like, um, you've left the clerking clinician blank. You really shouldn't have done that. And you've also not put a basic management plan list. And I'm kind of disappointed that you didn't do both of those things. I was a bit like, you know, but I'm not a clerking clinician. Like I've, I've obviously seen them, but I can't put in that I've clerked them. And I also don't want to come up with a management plan that's wrong, if that made sense. Obviously I had ideas about what was going on, but I didn't want to commit them. And she was like, well, no, like, you know, you're the person who clerked them, you have to sign it. Um, if for no other reason than something goes wrong down the line and it comes back, we need to know that it was you that, that saw them in case it needs to be dealt with. And in terms of the management plan, you know, even you're a medical student, we wouldn't expect you to be right necessarily, but I'm the consultant, that's my job to be right. But if you don't give me basic management plan to work with, it kind of gives me no indication of at a glance what is going on. And you as the person who clerked them are in the best mindset to come up with at least a very basic plan, even if that plan is no more than ordering bloods, ordering x-rays and so on. So she didn't chastise me, like that, that's not a fair characterization. What she was trying to get at obviously was, look, you know, have some confidence in what you've done. You saw them, make a decision and report back to me and ask someone if you're stuck. So that was really good actually as a learning experience. And then the other experience is we saw a patient 
who just being very careful not to not to give away any specifics of the case he basically presented with a cardiac problem the the history that we took kind of screamed cardiac you're taught in medical school quite early on to to do a full thorough point by point history and the problem is is that in reality this full have you got this have you got this what do you do where do you live do you have any pets what are your pets names like this weirdly itemized list is actually in practice not how it's done at all but the reason it's done i think is to get you into that systematic mindset and making sure you're asking the important questions so things don't get missed and with the benefit of having just done a psychiatry rotation got the feeling that the patient kind of cognitively wasn't all there or that some things weren't weren't adding up and i decided to do a bit of a psychiatric history just to kind of play around and see see what was going on and it actually became apparent through exploring that 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 person was not really in a safe set of circumstances to go home for multiple reasons the point i'm making is that had we not chanced to go down that kind of avenue of questioning and it not that it would even normally be on your itemized list of questioning but I, I had the feeling that something just wasn't quite right trusting that gut feeling and then following up with those questions did actually mean that we had to consider keeping that patient in for their own safety and temporarily detaining them what i'm trying to pull together from both of these experiences particularly as you get towards the end of medical school I would say probably not so much early on, I wouldn't have had the confidence myself. But now, having done enough medicine as a student and having seen enough, I think you do actually know more than you kind of think you do and you, you are able to, to come to enough of a basic understanding to the point where your seniors and the, the doctors that you're working with do genuinely appreciate your, your input. Then very quickly, just to cover some bits from outside med school, and the only reason I go into this is that I, this weekend, have very, very much been experiencing the effects of burnout. I just, I've slept so, so much this week and not really eaten very much, which are kind of my, like, hallmark symptoms of burnout. Had our first article accepted for publication, which I'm so ecstatic about because not only is it going in a good journal, um, it's a thing about visual abstracts. I'm a reviewer for now three journals, but for one of them I focus purely on visual abstracts, graphical summaries of data, and an article that I contributed to on visual abstracts has been accepted not just for publication, but for publication in neurosurgery, like the journal Neurosurgery. I'm just over the moon about that. Still waiting on another article that is, is going through peer review at the moment. Um, so there's that. I presented a poster at a conference recently, virtually. Two posters, I suppose, technically. Um, but I did the Medics Academy virtual elective in the month of June, which was rough, particularly once the course restarted. But we did this virtual elective focused on med ed and then did our day of virtual surgical webinars, which maybe some of you came to and we then analyzed the data from that put it all together and then presented a poster at a national slash international um, online conference which was really really good and i've also been working on a systematic review um, with a really good team of, of doctors and other med students hopefully that's all coming to a close fairly soon and then me and my colleague aqua two of the social media interns for asme the association of study of medical education. We've been working on some stuff with the two journals, medical education and the clinical teacher that fall under the bracket of ASME. So we've got some, some cool stuff coming to the social media channels of those journals and some new projects that we'll be taking up and being assigned mentors and things like that. I'm really looking forward to getting into that scheme a bit more. And I've been churning away on medical essay competitions. I think I managed to enter nine at this point and they're all kind of between a thousand and three thousand words and I'm just trying to churn them out in my spare time. Um, doing stuff with Brainbook, doing stuff for their online tweetorials and it's just keeping super super busy which is obviously why I'm on the edge or have burnt out this past week. Ultimately I do love it. I'm doing the Edward Jenner leadership course, the same people that do the Mary C. Cole leadership program which my mum actually did last year uh, randomly so I've been doing the one under that, which you can do as a medical student, just 
because it seemed like a good thing to do while we have the time. Yeah, thinking about jobs, wanting to put in for the Academic Foundation program, still trying to get this book out, which is just being an absolute nightmare. Busy, busy, busy. Um, and obviously anything that I can do for you guys as we move forward in terms of getting you into med school and enjoying med school and getting involved with projects and research, things like that, please just let me know. But this was a good chance to vent, a good chance to document what's been happening. And that's where we'll wrap up. This has probably gone on for far too long. So take care and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching guys. There are three ways you can support the channel. The first one is to like, comment, subscribe, share this video with a friend. Just enjoy it generally. Second, you can buy me a coffee if you found it useful using my Ko-Fi link, which will help keep me awake during the editing process. And then thirdly, you can use my referral link to save 10% off your first year of Complete Anatomy 2020, my favourite 3D anatomy learning tool. Take care guys and I'll see you next time.